come. That's the word coming in from our market guru Mahesh Nandurkar, who believes we will see more selling going ahead. It's not uh, necessary that this selling uh, can come to an end. I'll not be surprised if uh, we see uh, some more selling going forward. Country's largest car maker Maruti Suzuki all set to launch its all new SUV on 20th July. Reports suggest that new SUV will be competing with the likes of Hyundai Creta and Kia Steltos. Government set to garner over 1 lakh crore a year from the taxes imposed on export of fuel and windfall gains made by oil companies, says Morgan Stanley. Brokerages are mixed on the impact on ONGC, even as they remain largely positive on outlook for reliance. Cryptocurrency exchange Vol suspends all operations over financial crisis, becomes first Indian crypto exchange to suspend withdrawals, trading and deposits a mid-market downturn. Market snapping a three-day losing run to end a volatile session in the green. Sensex gained over 300 points to shut shop at 53,234. Nifty also ending above the 15,800 mark. FMCG stocks were the darlings of the Lal Street today. Nifty FMCG was up about 3% after palm oil prices fell 10%. ITC continues the up move with the stock rising to a three-year high. Metals continue to lose sheen as global prices fell. Broader markets outperformed the benchmarks. Three of the top five nifty gainers today, FMCG stocks, HUL, Britannia, ITC, other blue chip gainers, uh, Indusind Bank and ICICI Bank. On the downside, ONGC slipped another 4% as windfall tax continued to weigh. TCS, Tata Steel, JSW Steel and Sipla among some of the other top laggards. Shares of state-owned oil and gas companies ONGC and Oil India were trading lower for the second straight day, falling up to 6% in the session after the government's imposed a windfall tax on domestically produced crude oil and fuel exports and said it would only withdraw the tax if global prices of crude fall as much as $40 a barrel. Besides, it also imposed a cess on domestic crude output. Analysts say the development is a setback for refiners as they cut FY23 estimates steeply. The imposition of the new excise duty will severely restrict benefits uh, from elevated global crude oil prices to earnings of companies like ONGC and Oil India. However, according to various brokerages, the new levies will give the government up to 1.3 lakh crore in additional revenue. Our global business editor, Udayan Mukherjee, joining us now. Udayan, uh, kicking off the week uh, with uh, a reasonable close today. Uh, what's standing out for you in terms of factors to watch out for? Market seems stable, uh, Abha, going into earnings season. But I think now the focus will shift to earnings. Uh, you know, the last few weeks have been a bit uh, topsy-turvy for the markets, if you will. Uh, there's a, been a lot of FI selling. Markets have gone down and retested lows, made new lows. And then they've come back and they seem to be consolidating at this point in time. So in a one sense, you could say that markets have digested this leg of the fall. And now they're waiting for the next bit of news to come in. And the news actually could be earnings because as you, a lot of people have been pointing out on this show as well, that the PE led fall probably has happened already or quite a bit of it has happened. And now it's up to earnings. Uh, and if earnings start to get downgraded quarter after quarter, then this market will run into very serious uh, headwinds and it will find it difficult to stay at this kind of level. So I think the focus is now going to be on the fundamentals, starting with the IT companies, which saw some downgrades last time around. If there are more downgrades this time, then I think the market will start to get quite worried as well. Globally too, markets have slipped, but they seem to be stabilizing around these kind of levels. I mean, sporadically, you're seeing bounce backs. So I think the mood is one of consolidation, wait and watch, and I think this earnings season will be quite important in determining the next course of movement or the next leg of the move for the market. And that should be how it is, because the markets cannot move on sentiment and liquidity only. They need fundamental drivers. So we'll wait to see the fundamental driver from earnings now. Guest on the show today, Mahesh Nandurkar, Managing Director and Head of Research at Jefferies. Uh, Mahesh has, is a veteran of the market and it's been tracking India for well over two decades now, probably closer to three. But Mahesh, great to have you on the show. And 
it's it's an opportune time because you've just come back from a fortnight with road shows in the United States where you presumably you've met a lot of the old India hands and the big investors. So you're in the right place to tell us what the mood on India is at this point in time. Is it still very negative? Should we expect much more of FII selling in the months to come? Or uh, did you come away with the sense that much of the selling is already done, not much to go? Thanks, Uden, and thanks, Abba, first of all, for having me here. Uh, well, it it is, uh, just to correct you then, uh, two decades, uh, not three. Uh, uh, you know, although I've lost a lot of hair, but uh, in, you know, still two decades. Uh, anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, to uh, you know, answer your question, yes, uh, you know, it's 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 been uh, you know a sort of quite interesting set of meetings uh, here with the uh, you know U.S. based investors, and uh, what I can say is that uh, you know while India has seen a lot of foreign selling already, as you rightly mentioned, uh, we've been seeing almost like five billion dollars a month kind of a net selling by the foreign investors over the last several months now. And we've seen more than $30 billion selling in the last six, seven months. Uh, but to put that number into the context of overall FII investments here in India, that's like more than $600 billion. So what we've seen, uh, you know, is, is, is still, uh, you know, only a small part. And the sense that I get, uh, you know, then is that it's not uh, necessary that this selling uh, can come to an end uh, pretty soon. Uh, I'll not be surprised if uh, we see uh, some more selling going forward. Uh, the reason is that the valuations of the Indian markets on a relative basis are still on the higher side. Uh, if you look at it from the emerging market uh, and the Asian, uh, Asia, Japan kind of a context. And while India always trades at a premium, uh, but the current premium is uh, much more than the average, primarily because of those low valuations in China. And uh, yeah, so that's one reason, which is uh, the valuation. And uh, secondly, at a slightly more uh, broader level or at a global level, uh, with the rate hikes uh, in the US, the way they are uh, sort of you know going through and uh, in the rest of the world as well. And I'm sure there'll be more rate hikes in India as well. Uh, that's not exactly a very conducive environment for equities. Uh, so, yeah, so to answer your question, uh, I'll not be surprised if selling continues for some more time. This is an interesting point, Mahesh, because, you know, a lot of your peers seem to be suggesting that the PE correction has happened in India. Now, whatever has to happen will probably be led by earnings downgrades. But you think that there is still room for PE contraction in an absolute term? I mean, price earnings multiples led by things like sentiment, technical factors like global selling, etc. Do you think that can bring down the PE notch for India even further from the correction that we've seen already? Yeah, I do believe so then because, uh, you know, when we talk about average uh, multiples, uh, the multiples move on either side of that line, right? And, you know, for the last several years, we have been on the higher side of that line. And we are now coming towards the average, but given the global backdrop, I will not be surprised if uh, we move uh, on the other side of that line. Uh, that's that's my kind of a limited point. And you know, also as I mentioned, uh, you know, earlier, uh, there is clearly, uh, you know, a surge for value trade going on uh, in the world, and especially with the policymakers in uh, China seems to be giving. Um, you know, some uh, indications towards, uh, you know, that policy easing part, uh, which, which uh, you know, has the capacity to attract, uh, you know, more uh, equity capital or more flows. But having said that, uh, you know, I must also uh, add right. that uh, I'm very positive uh, and I'm very constructive on the uh, Indian economic outlook, the corporate earnings outlook. I personally believe that uh, while the rest of the world uh, and U.S. and some of the other major markets are going through the periods of recession uh, driven by the much higher uh, interest rates that's uh, now prevailing, I believe that uh, India actually has a much lesser downside uh, on the earnings growth, on the GDP growth because of uh, the higher interest rate environment uh, because I believe that, uh, I mean, the Indian economy is at the cusp uh, of a potential uptick and if it wasn't for the global headwinds, um, I think the GDP growth would have uh, surged much more. 
you said earlier that you don't expect major downgrades, uh, Mahesh. Uh, but the fear of downgrades actually is more in the commodity-linked segments because commodity prices have started coming off very sharply uh, this year. But, but before we talk about metals, perhaps you could tell us what you're doing with many of these upstream oil companies now because, you know, the windfall tax has probably led to a scramble to mark down earnings expectations for the ONGCs and reliances of the world. Do you think that sector will struggle going forward? Yeah, I think with the uh, you know latest changes in the regulatory environment and the uh, export tax and production tax, etc., or cess, etc., uh, it has definitely created an environment of uncertainty uh, in the you know in the you know both the private players as well as uh, you know the public sector players. And uh, you know my sense is that uh, you know given uh, how you know we have seen the situation has evolved. Uh, you know, on the marketing margin side, there was an expectation that, uh, you know, once the uh, UP state elections are over, the marketing margins will get normalized in due course of time. Uh, but that, uh, you know, is still awaited. Uh, so I think there's also going to be a worry that, uh, you know, how long will these windfall taxes remain and, you know, whether uh, you know, even after, let's say, the oil prices has corrected or the refining margins have corrected, uh, whether, uh, you know, these taxes will still continue to stay on for some more time uh, after that. We don't know. So it definitely has created some element of uncertainties, uh, you know, in the minds of investors, which is which is probably going to weigh on these stocks. You can catch the full interview on businesstoday.in as well as our YouTube channel, Mahesh Nandurkar, on his strategy and outlook going ahead. We take a very quick break on that note. Back to more news on the other side. Can you imagine a world where you won't be allowed to dye your hair, don fake nails or wear the clothes you like, all because you're a woman? Well, welcome to Turkmenistan. Restrictions on women's freedom Women in Turkmenistan were ordered to take away their beauty items and pay penalties of around $140. It's roughly half of the ordinary Turkmen monthly income. And why? It's a bid to mitigate foreign trends harming Turkmen traditional values. Many women also lost their jobs and work opportunities because of alleged breast implants or lip injections. Women are also not permitted to sit in the front seat of a car beside the driver. Similar bans were placed in the past, but they were never this strongly enforced. The new restriction goes a step further, forbidding jeans and any other clothing that's too tight. Police take their pictures, make a report and then find the women. Many have naturally condemned the ban, stating it robs women of their freedom. It violates their right to bodily independence and the autonomy to dress and groom themselves as they see fit. Turkmenistan was a part of the Soviet Union. The Soviets ran campaigns to abolish backwardness in Central Asia through the initiative of women's independence. But Turkmenistan sought to re-traditionalize the nation after breaking away from the Soviet Union. Women played a significant role in the establishment of a post-Soviet Turkmen identity. Experts have pointed out that Turkmenistan's concerns about women's fashion, appearance and demeanor are essentially about purity and strangely, male honor. Article 29 of Turkmenistan's charter gives men and women equal civil privileges and advantages. Turkmenistan has also been part of global women initiatives. It was a part of the Fourth World Conference on Women, Action for Equality, Development and Peace in Beijing in 1995. It also signed the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. The Turk Welcome back. The country's largest car maker, Maruti Suzuki, all set to launch its new SUV on the 20th of this month. Speaking to Business Today TV's Chetan Bhutani, Shashank Srivastav, Senior Executive Director at Maruti Suzuki, mentioned uh, about the launch, its sales numbers for the month of June. Maruti, remember, sold a total of 1,55,857 units last month. That's a growth of 5% uh, versus June last year. Here's a slice of that conversation. Tell us about the numbers. Uh, witnessing growth of 5%, uh, exports also going good. Give us a highlight of the numbers. 
Yeah, so um, actually the number are re uh, relatively flat when you compare with uh, uh, the May month and also when you compare it with last year. However, um, uh, last year we, uh, we had a full month of production and this year we slightly different because we had a, a maintenance shutdown. Our factory was closed for a week. So uh, there is some effect of non-availability as far as production is concerned. We have a good number of pending bookings, as you know, almost 300,000. So uh, going forward, we hope that uh, we'll increase our production and try to increase the numbers uh, from here. Also, uh, for the industry, this uh, was a good quarter because um, uh, this quarter, uh, the sale was almost 909,000. This is uh, followed by a Q4 of last year financial year, which was uh, 922,000. So there are two consecutive uh, quarters of 900,000 plus. And I think that's the first time ever in uh, uh, Indian auto industry. So there is some issues relating to semiconductor supplies, but still I think the demand parameter seems to be holding good at the moment. Uh, with, with Maruti expanding its portfolio for, uh, for Bre from Breza, there has been a lot of uh, human cry, especially over social media, uh, that when is the Jimny coming? There's been all raised up excitement about that. So uh, that's why I'm seeking an answer because every time I ask you this yeah, question, yeah, so I'll uh, definitely I'll answer this question. Um, uh, first of all, um, we have said this before uh, that we will be focusing on SUV uh, segment in a big way. And the reason also uh, uh, is, uh, we have mentioned before is, that while in the non-SUV space, our market share is 65% plus, which is a very healthy market share, and it's also the highest we have had for the last 20 years. But when you combine it with SUV market share, our overall market share falls below 50%, which is the objective which we always uh, have, you know, a 50% of the market. So, um, uh, uh, one of the key reasons for uh, that is uh, our non, no, I mean, it's not a great uh, market share that we have in the SUV segment. Of course, we are still number one player in the B segment for the last five years, including the last year. However, it, our market share is around 20%. So, while we are market leaders with 20%, uh, when you compare it with 65% of non-SUV market share, it is obviously pulling down the overall market share. And therefore, we had launched the Brezza, which is the market leader in the entry SUV segment. So that is a very large part of the SUV segment. Uh, the next largest part is the mid SUV segment, which is 18% uh, of the overall market. And um, that uh, segment uh, is basically for a larger SUV, uh, maybe a 4.3 meter uh, type of SUV. And that is what we are going to launch very shortly uh, we will be unveiling the same in, 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 in July, uh, on July 20th, actually. We will be unveiling that. And um, uh, it has two power trains, uh, the strong hybrid and the mild hybrid power train. The, the full production of that model, however, will start in August. But uh, on 20th July, we will unveil it. And that is another foray into a segment where we have no almost no presence. And therefore, um, that is an important part of our SUV journey. Uh, the next few uh, uh, ones, including the Jimny, which you are uh, referring to, we had uh, uh, we had shown showcased the Jimny in the in the 2020 um, Auto Expo. We collected some extremely good feedback, and uh, right now we are finalizing our marketing plans for that. Including, you know, the date of launch, etc., etc. Uh, so July twentieth, we are not expecting uh, the Jimny to be coming up, or it will be an entire new vehicle from Maruti. No, it will be an entire new vehicle from uh, Maruti Suzuki, which will come up on twentieth July. Now let's get you a state of the economy view from none other than Sanjeev Goenka, chairperson RPSG Group, who spoke at India Today Conclave East with Rahul Kamal. Listen it. Start by getting your macro sense of the India story as you see it from your conglomerate uh, in terms of how we are on the back of the pandemic because there are lots of global headwinds that we are facing. The Russia-Ukraine war, uh, interest rates which seem to be rising with no uh, bottom and with no defined top which is clearly visible uh, and we've got a uh, time where inflation rates are continuing to rise very much. So how do you see all of this impact the India growth story from your prism? You know, I think uh, the headwinds in the global economy definitely impact everyone, including India. 
But having said that, we are in a much better position than any other country or most other countries. And I think the internal story is completely intact. Uh, the confidence is high. The stability is strong. And I think some investments have been announced. Some more will probably be announced. I think people are just waiting to see the end of the Russia-Ukraine situation and things like that. And just a couple of these factors, and then you will see a flurry of investments. That's my estimate. I remember the conversation we had at the same stage uh, when we'd come for the East Conclave, and that time as well, your concerns were similar. The headlines at that time were different. Uh, they had to do with the pandemic and the uncertainty on account of the pandemic. But this lingering uncertainty, previously on account of the pandemic, nor now on account of interest rates, inflation, the war, and the impact that this lingering uncertainty has on investment plans uh, for corporates such as you. You know, any kind of uncertainty definitely impacts the sentiment. But COVID, when it hit us, was a huge uncertainty. Everyone was scared for their life. Today, it's a political situation internationally. The Russia-Ukraine war, the impact it has on the oil prices, the impact it has on the inflation. I think the investment plans are drawn up by and large, but I think people are just waiting to announce it. And once there is an end to that situation, you will probably see a huge rush of investment happening in the country. But from a macroeconomic perspective, India Inc. holding back its investment plans at a time when uh, government finance is already stretched because you've got crude prices globally, uh, which are on the ascendant, creates a situation where you have a chicken and egg situation, where the government is saying our capacity to spend on... Uh, capital expenditure projects is now limited because our fiscal headroom is lesser. Corporates such as you very logically would say we need this uncertainty to end before our investment plans kick in. And that then uh, slows down the whole economy's growth prospects. A couple of years ago, you had underutilized capacities. Today, capacities are utilized. You have industries like steel, cement, paper, which are doing very well. As a conglomerate, what would be your capacity utilization levels? At this it's time? now, I think, 100% uh, across all our uh, factories. But some would then say that you've delayed investment already, that they should have started in, in the mid-70s, and by now you should be in a situation where you're waiting for new uh, industry to come into life. You know, uh, it's always relative, but if one had to look at a very simple situation, in the last 10 years, our asset base has grown from 7,000 to 52,000 crores. And I'm not sure that's reflective of a slow investment. This period has also seen the group move from being largely B2B to now being more and more on the B2C side. Can you talk us through some of the changes that were required internally in terms of employee attitudes, behavior, management thinking to be able to respond to this change? Significant, uh, and it's a very conscious move. We had decided a few years ago we will get away from government intervention intensive businesses. We will reduce our dependence on that. We will get into B2C, and you will see a much greater emphasis now on our newer, new age businesses, FMCG, uh, retail, sports, all of which are helping us connect with the consumer directly. And that will be the thrust, more and more thrust going forward. Of course, we are investing in our uh, IT-enabled services business. We are investing in our chemicals business. We continue to invest in our power business. So we are investing across the board. But the emphasis will shift significantly towards these new age businesses. As the crypto market continues to be on a steady decline, crypto trading and lending platform Vault has suspended withdrawals, trading and deposits on its platform. As per the company, the decision was taken due to financial challenges it was facing on account of volatile market conditions. My colleague Akanksha joining us for more on this. Akanksha, tell us how many investors use the platform, 
Uh, who are the other stakeholders in the exchange? And uh, what does this mean for other exchanges in India? That's right. We broke the news earlier today that Wall, a major crypto exchange in India, with over 50,000 active investors, has suspended all deposits as well as withdrawals on its platform. Moreover, all trading on the exchange has also been halted. The exchange has come on record and said that they're seeking external help from financial as well as legal advisors so that they can come out of this financial rout. The exchange is backed by giants like Coinbase and Valar Ventures, which is its investor Peter Thiel's venture capital firm. It's worth noting that Wall had also laid off 30% of its employees last month because of the economic downturn. And this firing fever is not isolated. Several other crypto companies have also laid off a significant amount of their employees, blaming the general economic downturn. Talking about Indian crypto exchanges, they are witnessing a steep trading volume decline. And this is being blamed on the 1% TDS, which became applicable from last Friday, that is July 1st. All right, Akanksha, thanks so much for that. Now, the newest entrant in the Indian airspace, Akasa Air, has unveiled its cruise uniform. The uniform focuses on aesthetics and comfort. Akasa's cabin crew will don the orange and black uniform, which is made using an eco-friendly fabric. Akasa Air is the first airline in the country to have introduced custom trousers, jackets and comfortable sneakers for its in-flight crew. The Rakesh Junjunwala backed airline is preparing to start operations towards the end of this month. That's where we leave it on the show tonight. Thanks for watching. Russia has defaulted on its sovereign debt. Moscow owes about $40 billion of sovereign bonds. Have the global sanctions now finally caught up? Is Russia in trouble or does it still have friends when it comes to handling its economy? The foreign assets and foreign currency that have been frozen by the international bodies is a grave concern for Russia given that even if Russia wants to make the payments, it really cannot. This sanction regime or the sanctions that have been placed against Russia with Russia now defaulting is a grim reminder of the political outcast it once had become and is now on the way to becoming. But is it? While the West wants to isolate Russia, there are still many countries who are standing by Moscow and are engaging Russia. So is it real trouble for Russia? Or will Russia see through this crisis as well as it did in the 90s? Now with the economy and finances at stake, how severe are the damages? Now Russia had 640 billion US dollars in foreign currency and gold reserves held overseas. Russia owes 40 billion in sovereign bonds and half of it to foreigners. That's the part that has been defaulted this year and it is a historic moment nonetheless. Having said that, the last time Russia defaulted was after the breakup of the Soviet Union. It also defaulted on domestic bonds in late 1990s but recovered very soon after. Investors across the world were monitoring what is happening to Russia and what is becoming of the situation vis-a-vis -vis the West. They were monitoring the global sanctions and therefore anticipated the default that... I don't read the news. I read between the lines to tell you the true version of events. The true story of our times. To document grief, the toughest assignment for any journalist to be from those who matter. Women politicians are gonna stick up for each other. Of those who should matter. I document the truth. I don't distort the truth. I don't glamorize the truth. I don't gloss over the truth. The ghosts of India's contentious medieval history have come knocking again. I hustle for the truth. On the ground, in the newsroom, in the I studio. I don't try to grab eyeballs. 
I inform you to make you see the point. To the point with Preeti Chaudhary at these times only on India Today. Are watching India today.